Hello, Toronto. Thank you for coming. This is great. Well, go hold on. My mom. You ready to say hi to my mother? Hey, mom. Hi. Oh, am I working yet? Just one minute, please. Thanks, Doris. You ready? And here's some fans of yours. How's that? It's only a couple thousand directors. I'll call you later. Yes. It's a convention. I'll call you later. Doris Frank, ladies and gentlemen.
shapeless shapes. <laughs> you don't have any questions, do you? <laughs> yes, sir. Can I ask how so many Star Trek actors ended up in gargoyles? How did so many actors from Star Trek end up on gargoyles? <laughs> J.D. Thomason, who is the Disney director, casting agent of Gargoyles, cast Marina and me in those two parts. And then I think Worf or Dorney came on, and then Brent, and they realized that they were getting great cross promotion between Disney <laughs> and Paramount. And plus, you know, pretty good group of actors on Star Trek. Uh, Kate was on it, I think, Brent, Marina. So it went on and on, and I wish Gargoyles. Had never been canceled. That was a great show. Great. What about the rumors of a gargoyle in the movie? Yeah. No, why? Yeah. That's right. Just right. <laughs> what about this idea for a show? Half hour, single camera. The Rikers in space. <laughs> it's Troy and Riker. Their wacky Uncle Data and their little dog Wolf. <laughs> Sort of the Jetsons, but more in the 28th century. Thing. Does that work for you? Yeah. yeah. Spread the rumor. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Uh, it's sort of a political question. When Gene Roddenberry created Star Trek, it was all about optimism in the future. And it seems in today's society, we're much darker than what was going on in the 60s. And, you know, your president down in the US. So I'm wondering, is that- It's not my president. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get that straight. <laughs> I'm wondering, with Discovery, it's taken this darker tone. Is there going to be more optimism in Picard or going uh, in the future? What do you think of, of Star Trek sort of going darker as opposed to its original message? Just an observation. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. I can tell you this much about season three of uh, Discovery. It is, in fact, much more optimistic. They've gotten themselves out of the mirror universe. They've gotten, you know, we'll let that for the, uh, the next Star Trek. Right. Um, after Gene died, some of the writers decided that uh, Deep Space Nine should maybe take a different tone, which I think it did to certain degrees of, of, of success. And the optimism that Gene infused in all of the shows and in all of us is, may not be as obvious as it once was, but it's certainly the driving force of his vision and the franchise. And Kurtzman and all the people who run our shows are very conscious that that canon is important to all of you and to all of us. Uh, JJ's movies, I thought, were very uplifting and wonderful. You stole, told stories, and you know they had. There needs to be conflict to make drama. So I'm, I'm here to share that uh, Discovery certainly is taking a more optimistic, traditional Star Trek approach in next season. Very cool. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, happy birthday. Thank you very much. Thirty-nine again. <laughs> Now, who do you think I share a birthday with? Uh oh. Four important Star Trek names. You ready? Bob Blackman, who was the costume designer for us for many, 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 many years. Dr. Pulaski, Diana Moldauer. You much, may or may not remember her from the second season. Mrs. Colombo, I believe she played. No, oh, that was Kate Mulgrew. The great space bird of the galaxy, Gene Roddenberry. He and I are the same age. <laughs> Wasn't that interesting as I thought it might be? Go ahead. Now we've got some of the bank if you're putting the tunic back on. Uh, Jeremy Ryan. The tunic? <laughs> uh, Jeremy Let's go back to that for a minute. You, <laughs> the cat's out of the bag that I'm putting the tunic back on? I look 80, okay? <laughs> and tunic meaning a spacesuit? <laughs> Would that involve spanks? <laughs> I hadn't acted in a long, long, long time. I hadn't played Riker for 18 years, and I've been very fortunate to be busy directing. I acted briefly in a movie in Winnipeg about 10 years ago, 
and I had a major anxiety attack because for whatever reason and I forgot how to act, I forgot my lines and it was not a pretty picture for a few hours. I got my shit together and ended up doing fine, but I knew, having, I had just directed two episodes of Picard with, with uh, Sir Patrick and as I said, his acting muscle was well toned and Marina had just closed having started a play on the West End in London. So I knew she was going to be in good form. So I was a nervous wreck. <laughs> it ended up going very well. But don't let anybody tell you it's like getting back in a fight. That's bullshit. That's acting bullshit. <laughs> Tunic. <laughs> really? That's She's a huge fan of my wonderful wife, Jean Francis. You know the best is Laura, currently the mayor of Port Charles in General Hospital. I have directed Jean, and she's awesome. She's my, first of all, my favorite actor. <laughs> and she's my favorite wife. <laughs> no, we, we, uh, we do well together. We acted in a number of shows together, and I would love to uh, have the privilege of directing her again. Did you meet on We met on an ill-fated nighttime soap opera called Barrison's, but at that time, yeah. she was much too young for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I just flirted with her. And in North and South, we fell in love, and that was it. We've been together for 35 years. Yeah! How's that pillar working for you guys? <laughs> right? This is well laid out, this room. <laughs> We have trouble shooting this crescendo. You can't see everybody. We got. Oh. All right, I'm going over here. Bye, guys. <laughs> it's like the shitty seats in the theater. <laughs> Obstructed view. <you. laughs> or at the. You have a beautiful baseball stadium. Too bad about your team. <laughs> so I love these young guys. Are awesome. Vlad Jr. is one of my new faves. I was a big fan of his father. Dante Bichette. His kid's amazing. It's really exciting, young king. Why you got to bring Stroman, I'll never understand. I know it's a hockey town, but it could be a great baseball town again. And hopefully, that will happen. Of course, the guy who's been sweet this week, but that's how it's done. Let's go, Raptors! Thank God, they all want you too. It's such a great town. And he was an interesting cat. I thought he liked it up here. That's another story. Yes. So, Star Trek has influenced Thank you for coming in uniform, by the way. I appreciate it. Wait a minute. Are you a captain? Of course. You're like 14. You're a captain? I couldn't be. I didn't get it. I can survive. Oh, you can drive. What's your, what's your favorite part about directing? Do I prefer acting over directing? 
Directing is a much better game. <laughs> uh, you know what I did find I liked about the acting when I was on Picard a couple weeks ago? You go in, you sit down, somebody puts makeup on you, they cover up your bald spot, they fix your hair, you're in clean clothes, you have an air conditioned dressing room, you get to hang out, they bring you free food. You go in the set, you do a couple of scenes, they say, oh, here's your chair. Can I get you anything? It's a pretty good game. I've had for a No, it's a directing so It's the best job in the world when you have good people helping you. Zadi. Can you share your most um, interesting or fun story from being on Star Trek? Something that you haven't told anyone yet. <laughs> I will share an interesting story, which I found interesting. Do you know who, uh, you know Worf? Yeah. Michael Dorn. And if you can envision the bridge of the Enterprise. Brent, I mean uh, Data, and LeVar, right? The beautiful and talented Dimzadi's over here on the left. Old Baldy's in the middle. <laughs> Wild Bill Riker's over here on the right. People are on the view screen, we talk to them. Whoever comes to town, Romulans, Klingons, we talk to them on the view screen. And up at the back of the horseshoe is big old dumb stupid war. <laughs> and I mean that in the nicest possible way. So for years, we did a show, we did 182 episodes of the show in four movies. And Data and, and uh, Jordy talked to each other, the three of us talked to each other, Data talked back and talked to us. Well, we all, you know, communicate. Nobody in seven years ever looked up to say a word to Jordy. And he had it, he had it up to here with this. So one day, he was in particularly Klingon mood. And we were called into the set. And Michael came onto the set with a, a raw egg in his hand. And he leaned over the horseshoe and he crushed it on Patrick's ball. <laughs> and the albumin and the white ran down his British visage. <laughs> Fact or fiction? <laughs> They're all working today. <laughs> no takers? <laughs> Fact or fiction? <laughs> Come on, that never happened. <laughs> if it's a good idea though, isn't it? <laughs> if you got the image, he's thought about it. I'll tell you a true story though, since you're in Zadi. Marina used to have a little dog named Skilagi. Did she ever talk about this dog? She actually had a little Yorkie that actually looked like a rat. And uh, it rains in LA about once every two years. And this was the day it rained. So she comes into the makeup trailer, and with, she always traveled with the dog. She's one of those people. <laughs> the dog literally is that big. So she brings Skilagi in, who's now soaking wet, so it looks like a wet rat. And she's got to get her makeup on and get her hair put on and all that shit. So Dorn, my close personal friend, Michael Dorn, and I say, Give us Skilagi and we'll dry him off for you. So we take Skilagi, we put him in a microwave. We close the microwave and we say, it's like 30 seconds should dry this little dog. Skilagi is no longer with us. Fact or fiction? A unique style, she said. Yeah. I steal from Spielberg, which is awfully a good idea. I steal from John Ford, Kubrick, 
you steal from the people who have made movies before you, and you hope to, uh, I mean, the people who know how to tell stories always start with the emotion, make sure that, the story, that that's the most important thing. You can make the most beautiful shots and do the most incredible action sequences, but if you don't care about the characters, they're, you know what they are. So it's, uh, you've got to stay on story, stay on uh, emotional connection. And hopefully, as we've had the good fortune in First Contact, pepper in some comedy. So that if things get too heavy, you can lighten it up, and then you can rebuild so that it, it has music to it. So it has a, not only rhythm, but it has uh, crescendos and decrescendos and speed and emotion. Master of Light helps too. <laughs> Pretty serious answer, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, outside, Star Trek aside. Star Trek aside, fair enough. <laughs> we should have film or a TV show you mostly go directing and why? Or are you most proud of? Outside Star Trek, what TV show have I most enjoy directing? <laughs> oh, I know, The Librarians. Yeah. The Librarians yeah. movie with the great Noah Wiley. We did one in Africa, we did one in New Orleans. The whole experience of making those shows, and that was a great, that's an interest, that attaches to this question. The tone of that, you know what the librarians are? Any yeah. of you guys? Yeah. That was that action, adventure, comedy combo plate that Dean Devlin and I both tried to achieve, both in leverage and in, uh, in the librarians. And the movies that we, especially the one we shot in Africa, was just a great experience at every level. Because it's great when it's on screen and you have a wonderful movie to show, but it's also great if you've worked with a company of people and you've traveled together and you've gone through the experience of living in another country and working with, you know, uh, craftspeople from other countries, and it was, it was quite rewarding in that uh, respect. <sighs> in the back. Yeah, there we go. Three for three. You go first. recently watched a rewatch which was great, and I The great Gene Simmons. Yes. Not from Kiss. <laughs> yes. I was going to ask about how long you've been directing at the time you got to work with her. You know, you're feeling a Hollywood royalty. She did have an Oscar. Yeah. I want to think I did for playing in Hamlet. It was, it was yeah. the first time that an admiral in such a unique costume. Um, and I was wondering what that was like for you. And how long have you been directing at that time? And that was a great episode. That's the Michael Dorn's favorite episode. Gene Simmons was a huge Trekkie, as it turned out, and she somehow had contacted Gene or Rick Berman or someone and asked if she could be on the show, and we thought, this is an awfully good get. So um, this part came up, we cast her in the part, and it was, I mean, she was magical, especially with Patrick. The scenes with Patrick, she, they were spectacular together. The costume was a credit to my birthday mate, Bob Blackman, but something interesting happened on the show. I learned a big directing lesson on that show. A mistake that none of us ever make anymore. There's a policy when you're making a television show that nobody gets released until the scene is completed. My friend Michael Dorn, who helped to kill Ski Loggy the dog, <laughs> asked me during a scene on Drumhead, I gotta go, I gotta date, I gotta get out of here. Is there any way you could shoot me out? I said, sure, buddy. So I did what I thought was shooting him out. I had him up against the wall. I got him on a wide shot. I got him on a single. I got so I said to the first AD, Jerry Fleck, who said, you can't release him. You'll regret it. I said, oh, don't worry. I'll be fine. I was an inexperienced director, to say the least. I said, don't worry. We got this. We got everything we'll need on him. So Michael goes off. We decide where we're going to shoot. We do a little bit over here. We come back over here. And Dorn should really be in this shot. That's where, that's where Warp was standing. So Marvin Rush, who was the cinematographer on that show, bailed me out and found a way to somehow swoop in on something else and swoop back out and you never miss where Dorn was. Okay. And uh, never let your actors go before the scene's done. That's good advice. In the back, these two guys. The last two questions. I got the Rikers in space I'm working on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh, I'll tell you anything you want to know about the car. I'm not allowed to talk about that. Before I go, I'd like to share an anecdote with you. Imagine if you will. I'm over here. Marina's over here. We're on the bridge. We're getting bombarded by phaser fire from some angry board or whatever. We're doing the ship, we're doing the ship shakes, remember all that business? Marina always managed to shake so that her hair landed perfectly and her breasts were up and well lit and she looked great. And Riker was kind of more random and he'd throw himself around like that. I talked about him in the third person. I threw myself around like that. But on this chair, where Sir Patrick sat, which by the way had been designed ergometrically to fit his tiny little butt and his back. So he was, he'd be riding in this captain's chair, taking hits from the problem. And this is what I heard sitting over here. Oh, Jonathan. Jonathan. 25 years in the Royal Shakespeare Company for this. Thank you very much for coming. Call my mother back.